I'd like to introduce our first two speakers. They are speaking to you on ethics and artificial intelligence. And just so you know, we spoke with so many people before uh, in trying to program this for you today. <clears throat> and what we kept hearing was that the Florida Bar was the first bar to really tackle what AI is going to do to our practice. And in part of looking at it, um, we had to look at the ethics. And the next two people are going to speak to you about the ethics of using AI in your practice. Um, the first is Timothy Chinaris. Uh, he is the professor of law and former associate dean at Belmont University College of Law in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, he teaches a course in legal ethics, torts, insurance law, and sales. And before he was a professor at, in Tennessee, he was the ethics director for the Florida Bar and his responsibilities included managing the Florida Bar hotline, ethics hotline. So if you've ever used that, uh, you probably had, uh, back then you probably had Tim, and he's active in professional associations, uh, including being chairs of the Tennessee Association's Ethics and Re Professional Responsibility Committee, and is on the general counsel, or executive counsel of the general solo and small firm section. Um, he is a graduate of Florida State University and received his JD from the University of Texas School of Law, went on to get his master's degree from Florida State University, and is a trustee and vice president of the Florida Supreme Court Historical Society. Uh, importantly, if you are looking for some directions on ethics, he authors the comprehensive legal ethics website, sunethics.com, and he co-authored the Ethics Treaties, Florida Legal Malpractice and Attorney Ethics. So hopefully not None of us need to refer to those, but if you do, uh, you've got Tim here to give you some direction. And then our next speaker is Elizabeth Tarbert. Uh, Elizabeth is currently the director of the Florida Bar's Lawyer Regulation Division. Uh, she worked first for the Florida Bar as an assistant ethics counsel, left and then returned in 1997 as the director of ethics and advertising, and sh there she supervises um, seven attorneys plus staff to provide ethics advice to all of us, including the ethics bar um, hotline, and then she is uh, responsible for reviewing lawyer advertising for compliance with bar rules. As ethics counsel, she provided staff support for the board review committee on professional ethics, the disciplinary procedure committee, and the rules committee of the Florida Bar Board of Governors. I have to say, she has also been immeasurable help, uh, tremendous help, sorry, wrong word, tremendous help in helping us figure out where we go with AI and ethics in our practice today. Elizabeth received her law degree from the University of Florida and is licensed in both Florida and Texas. So with that, we'll go ahead and let them start. I think you have the clicker? Yes, yes. Okay. I think you have to set it up. Good morning, everyone. I think uh, Tim and I were invited to speak first so we could scare everybody about AI so you don't just jump into it with both feet. <laughs> right. So we're gonna start with a hypothetical. Let me get a few words here first. Sorry. It's okay. While we're uh, setting that up, I wanted to, to just mention something I had noticed in looking over a story in the bar news dealing with the recent membership survey that the bar does every year or two. Uh, dealing with AI, there was a, a blurb that said at least 80% of the respondents to the survey said they don't use generative AI in their practices right now. But about the same percentage said that AI should be very closely regulated in the future. So what does that tell us? Well, it's an old truism in human nature. We're kind of afraid of what we don't know, right? And we see this in the ethics world all the time. We saw it way back when um, with the fax machine. What's that going to do to practice? Email, uh, the idea of cloud computing or outsourcing work overseas. All these have been things that have generated a lot of consternation in the ethics world. Uh, E-discovery, lawyers working remotely, and now AI. So it's, it's kind of back to the future with that, although AI obviously is different in a lot of ways. But in the ethics world, it has kind of raised the alarms, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Well, let's just re recreate that survey for a second. Who in this room has used AI? Okay, who, who hasn't raised their hand uses Westlaw or Lexis or Fastcase? Because that's AI. <laughs> um, the thing that I think most people are scared of, though, is generative AI, which is the AI that 
draws from giant resources to actually create new information. So it goes and, and creates something new for you, um, just like your own brain would. I, I use AI. I used AI to put together, the, you know, we used AI to put together this presentation. It's very handy. So, well, now we're gonna start with a hypothetical. Procrastinating Parker. Pro Parker's a last minute kind of lawyer. Um, Parker has a brief due tonight on an important legal issue that could be dispositive in Parker's client's case. Parker attended a seminar recently that talked about how helpful um, artificial intelligence can be as a time saver for lawyers. Uh, Parker doesn't have any subscriptions to any fancy AI or legal specific AI, so Parker goes to chat GPT, inputs the issue and a question, um, some facts from the case, and within minutes, um, a beautifully crafted brief that is exactly on point and is very helpful to Parker appears. Um, Parker files that brief exactly as written by chat GPT. So, just by show of hands. Parker, A, need not worry. AI is very reliable. B, should be worried about possible court sanctions. C, should be worried about possible disciplinary action. Or D, should be worried about possible court sanctions and disciplinary action. Anybody for A? A, it's so reliable. B, sanctions are in their future. C, discipline is in their future. C, D, both. All of the above. <laughs> yeah, the famous best answer, all of the above. So let's, let's talk about some of those issues. Well, you've got a situation with, the, uh, uh, with this where the lawyer's got to worry about the court, he's subject to the court, and the bar uh, is always out there concerned about your professional behavior, whether it's in court or otherwise. So um, either one of those can come down on him if there has been misconduct. Um, and here we have a look at some very basic rules, right? The first rule in the book, rule 4.1.1, uh, competence. Lawyer has a duty to maintain some minimum level of competence. Uh, the real question is, of course, what does that mean in the world of using a tool like generative artificial intelligence. How much technology competence is enough? The, the Supreme Court amended the uh, comment to this rule a few years ago to specifically mention technology. And so we, we try to answer the question, how much is enough? Well, and I think it's also important to note that in that same time frame, the court also amended our CLE rule to require us all to take three hours of technology CLE every reporting cycle. And that is to underscore how important this issue is. Lawyers use technology in their practice. It's a tool, like any other tool. I'm gonna back that off a tiny bit. So um, it's important for lawyers to understand what's going on in the world, how, it, how their practice can be adapted to it, or it can be adapted to their practice. Otherwise, they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't be competent in the technological sense. What about other ethics issues? Well, I, I think uh, one thing here before we leave the, the competence is not only competence to use the tool, but also competent representation means avoiding the temptation to dive into an area that you're not fully competent just because you have a tool. And I think we're seeing that uh, certainly with some people that the idea that they think because AI is available, they can delve into a practice area that they're not as familiar with and that's kind of dangerous. Yeah, I think lawyers come of two stripes. There's a smaller percentage of lawyers who jump in with both feet um, regardless of what the issue is or the new technology that comes out. And then there's the large pool of lawyers who are very, very cautious. Um, and sometimes maybe they wait too long to jump into something now. So there are other issues, though, that relate to this issue. Um, and in 4-5.3, you're allowed to use non-lawyer assistance, whether it's assistance, A-N-T-S, like a non-lawyer who works for you, or assistance, A-N-C-E, which is you get assistance from some other source. However, when you do that as a lawyer, you're responsible for, for the work product. So um, you can delegate specific tasks to someone or something else, but you always remain responsible for the work. You're the one whose license is on the line. 
This was fleshed out in a Florida Bar opinion a few years ago. I think it's 07-2, dealing with outsourcing work overseas when that was a big, big issue. And a lot of those principles, in that opinion, are very similar to what we're dealing with with a new technology like AI. The lawyer is responsible, and there's really uh, not much else to, uh, to add to that in terms of using something and, and putting your name on it. Well, something that is important when you deal with non-lawyer assistants, when it's, whether it's ANTS or ANCE, is to make sure you understand the parameters of what you're using. So if it's your own non-lawyer employees, obviously you can give good instruction, which you should do, and make sure they understand what your obligations are, because your obligation is to make sure their behavior conforms to the rules of professional conduct, just as if they were you. Um, and when you use... ANCS or ANTS, if it's outside your law firm, to make sure you understand what the contract is between you and that other entity or person. So, you know, as tedious as it is, you might have to read the terms of service. Everybody just goes click agree, click agree, click agree um, in apps for terms of service, and I do too, which is okay when I'm using my own personal phone for my own personal purposes. But when I do it on behalf of a client, I have to make sure I understand what the agreement is because there are applications that will use your information, whatever information you provide it and information you don't even think you're providing to it for their own, for its own purposes. So what else, Tim? Well, we've got another issue that I think is a very important rule and that is the, the duty of candor to the court, rule 4-3.3. It's a very important uh, rule in, in the eyes of courts, obviously, and of the bar as well. I always tell people that the three most sure ways to get into serious disciplinary trouble are a criminal conviction, stealing from a trust account, and lying to a judge. And so we're not dealing with the first two here today, but the, the idea of saying something to a judge that isn't true uh, and that is important uh, is triggered if you do as our... Uh, Guy Parker in the example here, you file something without really verifying it, and it turns out that parts of it are not true. Um, and then you have court rules like Rule 11, which is a counterpart to the bar rules, state uh, rules like that, that point out that the, uh, the real responsibility here is the lawyer to make sure that things are presented to the court truthfully and accurately and, and not uh, with any misleading omissions. And although the, the rule mentions litigants and lawyers, uh, the courts tend to really focus on the lawyers. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> so um, I, I can't underscore it enough. Tim is correct. Any kind of dishonesty, a lawyer is going to get minimum uh, rehabilitative suspension, which means the lawyer has to prove reinstatement before they can be um, reinstated to membership in good standing. And lying to the court can either be a rehabilitative suspension or even disbarment, um, because as the court has said numerous times, this is a system that depends on honesty. If people don't follow the rules and play fair, then we're not getting a just result. Um, and federal rule 11, actually calls for sanctions. When you sign a pleading, you are signing that you're not at, you're not filing the pleading for an improper purpose, like just to embarrass or delay someone. Um, you know what the, there are reasonable facts that underline, underlie your legal um, claim or defense, and either you have that evidence now that shows that, or you believe that discovery is going to reasonably lead you to that evidence that's going to support your claim. Um, and you have to have a reasonable basis in the law. And when you sign that pleading in federal court, you're saying all those things are true. Um, and just so you know, in Florida, we don't actually have the equivalent in Flo the Florida rules um, of general practice and judicial administration. Um, however, there is a subcommittee of the rules of general practice and judicial administration committee that's looking at adopting something like the federal rule 11. Frankly, it's kind of surprising that Florida doesn't, I guess maybe because of we've had section 57.105 that is similar to that. Uh, yeah, this area is one that lawyers need to be very careful, particularly because the bar rules uh, were changed not too long ago to uh, have a, a special track for handling complaints that come from judges. So if somebody makes the mistake of filing something that's inaccurate with a judge and it ends up in a referral to the bar, 
and that new process only makes it that much tougher for the lawyer. So better to, uh, to check carefully before relying on something like AI. And in federal rule 11, it's the, lawyer, the party and the lawyer and the lawyer's law firm who are jointly liable. So the law firm is also responsible, which kind of makes sense with our rule 4-5.1. Our rule 4-5.1 says as a supervisory lawyer, it's your obligation um, to make sure that there are processes in your firm to make sure that everyone complies with the rules. So that really dovetails very well with the federal rule 11 on those sanctions. So now let's just see how that plays out in real life. There have been several cases in the last few years where exactly this has happened, where a lawyer has put information into ChatGPT, um, gotten a lovely brief, because you know, ChatGPT, artificial intelligence, it wants to give you what you're looking for. You know, it wants to give you the brief that you, that you want. Um, sadly, what that means is uh, the artificial intelligence, they call it hallucinates, and make stuff up, just like your own brain does. Um, you know, have you ever had that situation happen to you where you just recall the perfect case and you can't, you don't have the sight for it and you're just looking for it and looking for it because you're sure it's out there. I mean, I've had that experience. And um, sometimes, magically, that case does not exist. According to my wife, the hallucination thing started with me, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's a serious issue. And Sometimes the reaction when you find yourself in a position, or like this lawyer in the Mata case, found himself in a position, there was two lawyers I guess involved, and rather than acknowledging the issue and uh, immediately apologizing to the court and diving into it, they kind of dug their heels in and uh, doubled down on standing behind the false cases that were reported in this brief. And, that only made it worse. And that's really true in most of these cases where you see sanctions actually happening or pe people being referred is, um, they either double down on a bad deal or they blamed someone else. They blamed their intern, they blamed their legal assistant, which again, is never a good idea because remember under 4-5.3, even if you delegated a task to someone, it's still ultimately your responsibility. Yeah, and that defense is not gonna go too far in bar cases either because they're going to hold you responsible. Actually, it, it, my experience has been when you try to deflect blame, that only makes it worse. Agreed. If you think it can't happen in Florida, well, guess what? It already has. Um, there's a case in Florida where a lawyer was suspended in the Middle District of Florida for a year from practice um, for doing this exact thing. Um, they uh, put it, put information into artif generative artificial intelligence, submitted it to the court without reviewing it, um, and some of the citations were just out and out false, which is what happens. So if you're gonna use artificial intelligence, it is just a tool. You have to remember that, just like you would with a first year associate or a paralegal, you would double check their work. Well, and Elizabeth, I'm sure can't comment on pending bar cases, but uh, Mr. Newsom, uh, from what I understand, does have a pending bar case now dealing with a number of allegations, I looked at the complaint, and it includes violating the rules against diligence, violating the rules against meritorious claims, uh, candor to the court, failure to obey court rules, and the general rule about dishonesty or misrepresentation. So um, not a good idea. And in that case, too, he also, rather than being fully candid with the federal court investigating committee, he kind of hedged, well, maybe I use those tools. And again, not being fully honest uh, ends up backfiring again. Um, we also, in the materials, have some other cases other than the ones that have been up on the slide here. There's a few other cases. One I thought was interesting from New York, where the law firm was seeking a fee award, and they filed uh, a uh, brief that argued that the findings from ChatGPT could be used to cross-check their arguments for fee uh, award and, uh, and support their, their claims. And the court did not give much credence to that and they rejected it and said, uh, the attempt to use AI for that purpose was misbegotten at the jump. So um, they're not gonna be able to <laughs> assess your fee award uh, in an artificial intelligence way. So how have the courts responded to this issue? And there are a number of courts that have issued individual local orders 
um, specific to generative AI. Some of them are just AI, some of them are generative AI. If it's just AI, we're all in trouble because we all use Westlaw or LexisNexis or FastCase. Um, but th the savvier courts, it's, it's limited to generative AI. And so this is an example of one of many of the local orders that requires lawyers to certify whether or not they've used it. Um, and that they have checked it for accuracy. So specifically, this same court has a sp specified certificate that they want lawyers to use. I think this is the Texas one. Yeah, this is the Northern District of Texas that uses this. And um, in looking at this, I saw that there were similar certification orders in states in Texas, Pennsylvania, Hawaii, Illinois, and other states. So uh, some of the states are taking rather than a case-by-case -case approach, trying to get a hold of this through a systemic approach of, of certification. Uh, interestingly, the Fifth Circuit was looking at this, and they published a notice saying we're, we're looking at adopting a certification requirement, and a number of law firms filed objections saying, we have existing rules on this, let's apply them to the new technology rather than create new rules for the specific technology. And uh, just last week, the Fifth Circuit announced that it was going to withdraw that proposal for a certification uh, requirement. And they said, you know, they think what the objector said was right, that lawyers, as they said, remain responsible for ensuring their filings with the court shall be carefully checked for truthfulness and accuracy as the rules already require. So maybe we're seeing things swing back uh, away from specifically dealing with AI, maybe not. I guess we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Well, I think the same is true in our own rules of professional conduct, what you could be disciplined for, is the rules were written to be broad principles that could be applied to numerous situations, and they have been to every new technological advance so far. I will say um, the Board of Governors has filed a petition with the Supreme Court to note generative AI in the comments to several rules, not amending the rules themselves, but just having a prompt to remind lawyers that when using generative AI as a tool, they need to be under understanding of the possible risks and benefits of using that specific tool. And law firms respond. Tim, what are law firms doing about this? Well, law firms are, are taking varying approaches, as you might expect. There are some firms that are absolutely uh, against the use of generative AI uh, by their personnel, and they've adopted formal policies, including some very large firms. Uh, their concerns are several. One, the accuracy of the information, the hallucinations we talked about. And one of the comments I saw I think was uh, interesting from uh, a person at the law firm who was speaking uh, to explain his firm's uh, policy against using AI. They said, well, AI tools are supposed to be used to predict what humans would say, but they're, they're not humans, and we don't want to use in the legal field an artificial tool to substitute for what should be judgment used by lawyers. So that, that's kind of the rationale on that side. Other firms go the other way. They say, well, this is a, a tool that can help, it can save time, it can provide a lot of benefits to our staff and our clients. And instead of saying we can't use them, what they're focusing on is proper training and supervision of people that do use that tool. Um, and a lot of firms are, I guess, in the middle. They're kind of taking a wait and see approach uh, to see where the the majority of, of firms go. So um, all of this is complicated, I think, also by the fact that firms that have large corporate clients, those clients have their own policies that deal with AI and the use of AI. Some want to use it, some are, are more skeptical, and so the firm needs to be careful to dovetail their approach with that of their clients. I did see a list of some principles that I thought uh, one firm used that, that really seemed appropriate, uh, generally speaking. One, we've already talked about lawyers remain responsible for their work product with AI or any other technology. One I thought was very important, they said lawyers should not dabble. What do we mean by dabble? That's a legal term, by the way, right? Uh, if they're not competent with AI, they should stay away from it and work with somebody who is, rather than risk diving in and, and not knowing what they're doing. Lawyers have to keep current on their rules and on their, their ethical positions in their state. Confidential information should not be input. That's one firm's approach. Uh, and the output should be reviewed by a lawyer. 
And then finally, I think going back to what we said before about the courts, lawyers should be transparent about when they've used AI and what they've used it for. I thought those were kind of good general principles. And one of those principles, circling back to where we started, which was the competence rule, you can attain technological competence, not just yourself becoming technologically competent, by, but by associating yourself with someone who is, in fact, technologically competent, which for some of us might be the smartest thing to do. Um, and following again with the courts, um, it's important to know what your local orders are. So the Fifth Circuit has now come down on the side of maybe we don't need any things special, but we still have orders out there from various courts that do want a certification as to whether or not you're using artificial intelligence. And under our rule 4-3.4C, you have an obligation to um, obey the obligations of a court. So if that court has, it, it, it behooves us all to look at our, wherever we're filing, um, wherever we're litigating, to look at that court to see if they have a local order in place. So. Florida is it, issued its own ethics opinion 24-1 in January of this year. If, if it's not the first state, it's certainly one of the first states to issue an ethics opinion on the topic of generative AI, and it talks about some of these same issues. Um, but let's talk, so um, I, it's in your materials. You can read the whole ethics opinion yourself, but it does talk about technological competence. Let's talk about some of the other rules Parker might have violated that are also discussed in the opinion. Well, can I say a couple of things about what, what sure. is not in the opinion? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and I uh, would point out a couple of important things I think are left out. Generally, I think the guidance is very good, and most of the other states that have adopted opinions since then, by and large, agree with the Florida uh, positions. But the opinion doesn't address a couple of issues that I think are gonna be important, uh, I think, they're really not addressed because maybe they're beyond the scope of an ethics opinion. But one of those is the, the unauthorized practice of law issue. The use of AI uh, in a way that would constitute the unauthorized practice of law or the unlicensed practice of law, UPL. Uh, and we'll talk more about that maybe in a minute. Uh, but another issue is that of legal malpractice liability and what the standard of care is going to be in a world with generative AI at lawyers' fingertips, and that's going to be uh, an area that we uh, will have to, to deal with and wait and see, and we'll say a few more things about that if we have a minute uh, toward the end. Uh, the opinion also deals with billing issues. I don't know if it's appropriate now to talk about that before we dive into confidenti confidentiality, and, and I think what it says is correct with respect to legal fees. Uh, the fees have to be reasonable, and they have to be honestly reported to the client. But let's assume that a lawyer bills at a, a rate of, say, $400 an hour, and normally a particular task takes three hours to complete. So normally that's a bill, three hours worth of, of work, $1,200. But if the lawyer can do that task in uh, 30 minutes, say, using AI, I think we, we all would agree that the lawyer can't charge three hours worth of work for 30 minutes worth of work, right? He has to, or she has to, uh, report the time actually spent if you're going to bill on an hourly rate. So what's that going to mean? Well, the opinion suggests that maybe lawyers should start thinking more about fee for services, flat fees. So instead of uh, charging by the hour for that task, you charge what that task is worth. And if it's a reasonable fee is $1,200, then that's better than uh, $200 from the lawyer's standpoint, as long as it's reasonable. Which goes back to what we said at the beginning, the idea of you know, things don't change that much in the legal ethics world. Um, we talked 20 or 30 years ago about value billing, right? Yes, an alternative billing. I mean, this is everything in ethics is cyclical, which is true of many other areas of the law. We've been talking about alternative billing for years. And it's, I will say, again, this is an area where some lawyers jump in right away and there's a handful of firms that do alternative billing. But a lot of firms really uh, shy away from it. I, I feel like lawyers could probably advertise that they do alternative billing or flat fee billing and probably do very well doing that because clients really want to know what they're going to spend on a case. People going in on an hourly rate, they have no idea what their bill is going to be at the end of their case. 
Yeah, all the risk is on the client, other than, of course, the risk of collection, which is on the lawyer. <laughs> um, the one thing I thought maybe the opinion could use some strengthening on is in uh, two, two areas. One, one is this, uh, the area of charging AI as a cost. Um, costs or expenses can be charged to clients. You're supposed to, if you charge a cost that you know is specific to a client, you're supposed to charge that cost. Well, that, that's fine, I think we all agree with that. But the opinion goes further and it says, if the lawyer is unable to determine the actual cost associated with a particular client's matter, the lawyer may not ethically prorate the periodic charges of the generative AI and instead should account for that as overhead. And I'm not sure this advice is totally correct in light of the bar rules if you're talking about an in-house tool that's been developed by the lawyer. Because if you look at the, the, the fee rules and the cost rules, 4-1.5, it allows the lawyer and the client to agree to pay a reasonable cost for in-house services. And the comment to the rule says, a lawyer may agree with the client to charge a reasonable cost for in-house costs or services, and they include things like copying, faxing, and computerized research. So it seems to me that a reasonable cost related to AI might be something that would fly, but of course, that's gonna be up to Elizabeth and the folks at the bar. <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, that case has not come yet. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. So, Can you go to the mic, please? Or uh, it's thank being you. recorded. It's being recorded. So we want to have everybody hear the benefit of the question. Test, test. There you go. Um, so you mentioned that you know a lawyer can't charge three hours of work if they did a half an hour work using AI. Do we end up in a spot where the opposite ends up becoming true? Where lawyers should be using AI to do something that would take a half an hour, but instead decide to do it the old fashioned way and they do it in three hours and then they charge their client three hours. Is that an unreasonable charge? Well, that's an interesting question. And I think the further we go down the path of AI, which is gonna happen, the more relevant that question's going to become. I think at this point, the amount of time you spend checking actually might be more than if you had just done the research yourself using a more conventional tool that has, you know, indicia of reliability. I mean, I, nobody questions going using uh, Thomson Reuters, doing your research there. Nobody questions whether those sites are valid. That's what they're using to check your sites to make sure they're valid. Um, but when you're talking about using generative AI and you know it can hallucinate, you know it can make up the names and citations for cases and they look, they look reasonable so they look like they're real, when you are spending all your time site checking, that might end up being more time now. Now, as the tools get more reliable, um, it's quite possible it will take much less time uh, to either it, it only takes seconds to generate this stuff. If you've ever, ever done it as a test, it takes seconds. Um, but the checking takes much longer. Um, at, at the point where it becomes more reliable, I, that it could be that you know maybe you're engaging in malpractice by not using it, and over or you're overbilling your client by not using the tool. And that's exactly. I love this question because it's one I had as an example when we talk about where the malpractice standard of care is going to go. At some point, it might be a violation of the standard of care to choose to do it manually. I don't think we're there yet because of the things Elizabeth mentioned, but I can certainly see that as an issue. If somebody said, I am going to shepherdize using the old paper shepherdize method and tried to bill a client for that today, I think that would be unethical and a malpractice claim. If of course, they don't even publish the shepherd's print anymore, but if they did, it would take a lot longer to use it. So yeah, very, very good question. I think that's one that we're gonna have to grapple with uh, in the, the legal uh, arena of malpractice, which frankly often is a lot murkier than trying to figure out what the bar rules say. Yeah, I think the bar rules are actually pretty simple. So let's talk about another one, which is confidentiality. This is something that's mentioned by every ethics opinion that writes on this subject, including 24-1, the Florida ethics opinion. And that is, just as a reminder, um, the confidentiality rule is much broader than many people suppose, including many lawyers. Many people equate privilege and confidentiality, and those two things are not the same. Um, confidentiality is everything that relates to a client's representation, and a lawyer's not allowed to voluntarily disclose that information without an exception applying or client's consent. 
And obviously the most used exception is it's something that serves the client's interests except where the client has said you cannot disclose the information. So when you're dealing with generative AI, you have to put information in to get information back out. Um, and depending on the information you're supplying about your client's case, it might be so specific to that client that you're disclosing confidential information. And what about the situation where maybe you and your opponent are putting in information about the same issue at the same time? Generative AI learns from all the data that gets input into it. So you might get information about your opponent that you didn't know and vice versa. Something related to confidentiality uh, that is, is mentioned a little bit in the opinion is the issue of the duty of communication that a lawyer has to a client. And I think these two go together, 4-1.4. Uh, uh, one of the duties listed in that rule is the obligation to reasonably consult with the client about the means that will be used to try to accomplish the client's objectives. And that raises some questions that I, I don't necessarily have answers for, but things like must you tell uh, the, the client that you're using AI tools uh, or is it, I guess on the flip side, dishonest or, or deceitful not to tell the client that you're using that tool? What if the client insists that a tool, well, I know you can save time and money if you use this tool. Uh, you're billing me uh, you know, too much, you're spending too much time, use this. Do you have to go along with that? Those questions are, are kind of out there. The issue of confidentiality, though, specifically, the opinion does talk about um, implied consent. And then it goes on to, to say that you know, this, this rule, um, this exception C1, may, may not apply in all situations. And so it's recommended that the lawyer, if the lawyer is going to input information about the client's case into a public uh, tool like ChatGPT, uh, in that case, client consent is recommended. But I think it's a little confusing because later on in the opinion, it goes on in a footnote to suggest that consent to the use of generative AI when you're inputting client information might be required. And so I think the prudent lawyer will look at that and say, well, if I'm going to do this, I, I want to have the client consent. So I've, I'm seeing more lawyers put a consent provision in their retainer agreements to say, you know, we may use these tools in servicing you and handling your case, and you uh, agree to that. And then one thing Elizabeth mentioned is uh, that, again, is probably beyond the scope of the ethics opinion, is the effect that using generative AI might have on the attorney-client privilege. Uh, if somebody uses a public-facing tool and puts in client information, that information shows up later with the opposing counsel or otherwise to someone else, that can be a privilege problem, right? Because now that information that communication has been disclosed to others. But even if it doesn't actually end up getting repeated to somebody else, you have an argument that the mere fact of inputting that information into what is essentially something that can uh, be accessed by others shows that you had no intent to keep this particular information confidential. And that, of course, is a foundation to be able to claim privilege, that it was intended to be kept in confidence. So I don't know the answers to those either. It's too early, but I'm sure we will see that litigated as well. Now, obviously, there's a difference between in-house homegrown artificial intelligence and having, using a third-party provider. If you have your own in-house and you have appropriate security for it, you don't have the same confidentiality concerns, but you also probably don't have as big a database of information to draw from. So the opinion does suggest, though, if you use a third-party provider, that you understand what the provider's obligations are to you, whether they keep the information confidential or not, whether if they are subpoenaed for information, whether they notify you before they respond to the subpoena, whether if there is some kind of data breach, they will inform you that a data breach has, has occurred so you can try to protect your client's interests. Um, and also whether or not they feel like they own the information. Um, there are. You know, there are applications where they say all the information that comes into it is their property, not yours, and then you'll be fighting over whether your client owns their own information or some application owns it. And again, these principles aren't new. We saw those in a number of cloud computing uh, opinions uh, that pointed out that you, know, you need to protect your client's information. That's an obligation in the ethics rules. All right, so we've already talked about billing, so let's move on. Ooh, are we in the right spot? 
Yeah. Let's move on to a different topic, Virtual Vinny. Consumer Connie visits Virtual Vinny's website. Connie has a potential family law case. A chat box pops up, as it often does on a lawyer website, with the text, got a question? Connie types a question about whether Connie can obtain sole custody of a minor child into the chat box. The chat box response should be, A, absolutely, if you hire Virtual Vinny. B, under your facts, yes, disclaimer, this is not legal advice. C, the answer depends on specific facts. Please schedule an appointment to discuss with Vinny. Or D, I'm not a person, I'm a chatbot. You need advice from a lawyer. How many people think A is the correct answer? Nobody? But virtual Vinny is so good. Um, B, under your facts, yes. C, the answer depends on your specific facts. Or D. So it's a trick question, I think C and D are both Okay, except C would be better if it said, uh, I'm not really a person. That brings up the issue that is mentioned in the opinion, <laughs> the idea of disclosure uh, when people come to your website and are chatting with someone. Is that a real person or not? I represent a lot of law firms that do advertising, and this is a discussion that is, is being had. Uh, what do you have to say? Because a lot of them do use the chat bot feature. And the opinion suggests that if it would be misleading, uh, as it says, to avoid confusion or deception, a lawyer must inform prospective clients they're communicating with an AI program and not with a lawyer or law firm employee. That's probably news to a lot, of, a lot of firms. So interestingly, just going back, I'd have concerns about B, because when giving legal advice, you can't really disclaim away that you're giving legal advice by saying, this isn't legal advice. Um, that kind of feeds into the UPL question to some degree. And also to the question of, are, have you inadvertently formed an attorney-client relationship with somebody? You gave them legal advice. Um, in Florida, like most jurisdictions, the question of whether an attorney-client relationship exists is not based on the lawyer's beliefs or the lawyer's understanding. It's based on the client's. So if a prospective client has a reasonable, subjective belief that they got legal advice from you. You have an attorney-client relationship whether you want one or not. Well, and at the very least, you're a prospective uh, client relationship there. And th that rule, 4-1.18, does impose some limited duties of confidentiality and even conflicts on the lawyer. So um, better to make it clear. It's kind of a losing battle I've had with a lot of my clients, trying to get them to put disclosures on the website to make it clear that we're not asking for confidential information. We don't want to form a relationship until we both agree on that. So that's something that should be, I think, mentioned. Um, and you did mention the UPL issue. Uh, if, if Vinny is the one that programmed this and wrote out the answers that the chatbot gives, it, it's probably, in my opinion, not UPL because the lawyer has created, approved, adopted the response. But uh, if it is pulled out of a database and the machine does it itself, uh, that's an open question. But we could change the facts. Here's a lawyer doing this. But let's say Digital Dan, we'll call him. He's not a lawyer, but he has a website that uses uh, AI, and he has a chat bot that answers your legal questions. So maybe Dan even goes further and he advertises that he can take the facts from a prospective client who has a legal issue and use his AI tool to provide information or even, heaven forbid, legal advice to answer their questions. Now is that UPL? I think you're a lot closer to it because even though the machine arguably you know, can or cannot provide legal advice, the person using it as a business to interface with others, I think, has a UPL concern. Or what if you're virtual, Vinny, and you hire a third-party vendor to do your chatbot for you? I mean, I think that also raises both formation of an attorney-client relationship and unlicensed practice of law concerns, because you have some third party who's making all the decisions there. A lot of unanswered questions. Okay, so let's talk about the future. Future. This is great where we can all just predict and hopefully this recording won't last too long and, and you won't know it'll expire we're in 18 months and nobody will know whether we were right or not. Uh, but uh, one concern I've seen is will AI, particularly generative AI, replace paralegals? And, and there's differing views on this. 
But I like what one paralegal said to other paralegals who were worried about it, and they said, chat GPT won't take your job. People who know how to use chat GPT will. So again, it's a tool, and I think the people that are competent in using these tools, you know, if you go back, I think we had the same discussion probably when the typewriter came in, right? Or when the computer came in. Oh, it's gonna replace paralegals or assistants, and it's just another tool for the skilled assistant to be able to use. It's interesting because we had an oral argument at the Supreme Court recently on a um, rules of general practice and judicial administration on transcripts. And the court reporters opposed proposed changes um, because their current system isn't set up for anything but monoface type and they use transcriptionists who, and uh, proofreaders who are used to monospace type. And Justice Curiel asked, and what is gonna happen six months, 18 months from now when generative AI is doing those jobs. So I, I think the court sees that, that generative AI is, is happening, it's coming. What about the access to justice issues? One of the, th one of the actual um, really great possibilities for this tool is the possibility to use this for uh, pro se litigants. Um, or, or other people who are pro se, whether they're a litigant or not, doing, say, doing transactions. Um, if this tool could be developed well enough, people would be able to use it um, who can't afford a lawyer's services. I think there is a lot of discussion and a lot of hope on the access to justice uh, front that this will improve the ability of people to get lower cost legal advice or information. But we do have some concerns. One is the accuracy, like Elizabeth said. When is this developed? When it's more accurate? The last thing you want to do is say, well, uh, you can't afford a lawyer, but we can give you bad advice for a lot less. Uh, so we don't want to do that. And then the issues of UPL. I mean, that can all be dealt with uh, by statute or by opinion, but um, it's, it's going to have to be addressed at some point. Well, interestingly, I think it's the New York opinion that actually talks about the access to justice issue, and they point that out. And one of the questions they pose is, is it, and I, I, don't, I can't tell you the answer, you all have to decide for yourselves, is, is it better for someone to have no help at all or flawed help? Right. Yeah, and that's, that's a tough question um, to answer. The issue of legal malpractice, we already kind of touched on that. I think that's important, uh, the effect of AI on the standard of care. Uh, we, we don't know what effect it's going to have, but I would venture to say it's going to have some effect. Uh, for example, is the standard of care going to evolve at some point to require the use of AI, like we talked about before, at least in certain circumstances? Another example I think that's interesting is AI is a predictive tool. And so there are uses of it to predict what a case is worth or what a jury would do at a particular jurisdiction, uh, predict the outcome. So let's say a lawyer gets a settlement offer and AI shows that that offer would be very, very difficult to top if they went to trial. But the lawyer, in years of experience trying cases in that jurisdiction, really doesn't agree with that. So at this point, is the lawyer acting unethically or committing malpractice? if the lawyer fails to advise the client based on AI to accept that, or does the lawyer's judgment supplant that? And how do the two go together? So we'll, we'll have to see where that goes. So we actually asked ChatGPT the UPL question. Can using ChatGPT to obtain legal advice constitute the unlicensed practice of law? And it says, yes, maybe. <laughs> Because in a very long way, it says, yes, maybe, um, which is accurate as far as it goes, um, but it's not much of a help to anyone. This looks like an answer that uh, I've seen on final exam questions where somebody didn't know the answer. Uh, and so they, they want to say it with a lot of words. So, yeah, we don't really know here. And, and it's so jurisdiction-specific. The UPL question, I mean, there's a case in Texas a number of years ago where Quicken had a, a software that would take, I think it was in the family law area, and the, the, the user would walk through it and get forms to fill out to do an uncontested divorce. And, and so the bar went after Quicken and, and they found that it was UPL. And the court agreed it was UPL. And then the very next session of the legislature, they passed a law that said this is not UPL. So we'll see. So then we also were worried about whether or not we could be replaced. 
And that's so, the bottom line, right? <laughs> Will we be replaced? So we asked, can using chat GP, uh, sorry, we asked uh, an ethics question. And the ethics question we asked is, will screening avoid the imputation of a conflict of interest with a former client of the same firm in Florida? And, shoo, it did not give a good answer. <laughs> yeah, well, so we are not yet out of a job. <laughs> what? It's a matter of time, right? So, it uh, yeah, it, it's, it's helpful. And this would be a good starting point if you were having somebody uh, look this up, and then you could take this and run with it. Um, so. There's a lot of questions out there. I, I want to say something as we, we wrap it up and then take some questions if we've got time. One rule that's not mentioned anywhere, I think is probably the most important rule of all for us to deal with in this area, and that's rule 4-2.1. And it says, in representing a lawyer, uh, a client, a lawyer shall exercise independent professional judgment and render candid advice. In rendering advice, a lawyer may refer not only to law, but to other considerations such as moral, economic, social, and political factors that may be relevant to the client's situation. This rule might be overlooked by some when we're talking about AI, but I think it's really the most important ethical principle here. Clients hire lawyers not just to perform services, but to give legal advice tailored to their situation. And that involves a lot of times use of other uh, skills and, and factors based on experience. The lawyer has to size the client up, draw on the lawyer's experience, look at the, the situation based on discussions with the client, on experience with the client, to guide the client in a path that's most likely to accomplish the client's legal goals. And I, I read a quote that said, AI can be better than humans when thinking inside the box, but lawyers excel, human lawyers excel at working outside the box. So the bottom line in all this, I don't think for the near future we have to worry about us being obsolete. Uh, I saw a slogan for a company years ago. Anybody that's heard me talk, I always use the slogan. Uh, and that slogan was, in a world of technology, people make the difference. And I think that's really true here as well, uh, probably more than anywhere else. It's a great tool, AI is excellent. It's gonna change the law of practice. Uh, but I don't think it's going to replace human judgment, at least not in my lifetime. Well, agreed, and I, don't, I know that you must have had this experience on the hotline as well, but, and all lawyers have this experience. Sometimes the most important things are the things the client doesn't tell you, or the person on the other end of the phone doesn't tell you, you ha and you can hear there is something missing, and you draw that out by asking questions. Right now, generative artificial intelligence is, you know, input in, you'll, it does generate information back, but until it, de you develop it so that it asks you the right, ask the person the right questions to get all the important information and draws from things other than what the person is asking for, that's what lawyers do. You see the connection to some other legal problem the, the client has. Um, and you know that you need to advise them that they have these other legal implications to their problem. That's where lawyers are not cur currently going to be replaced by AI, I think. And a lot of times the biggest question is the one they're not asking. And so it's up to you to figure out not only the, the answer, but the question sometimes and put them uh, on the right track. So I think we do have like one minute <laughs> if anybody has questions. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure being here with you this Enjoy morning. Join a lot. Thanks.